and it's two o'clock so we've got about half an hour to get through today's uh, webinar on what's new in Citrix Senap and Send Desktop. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. It is recorded for anyone who um, joins at a later date anyway or later time. My name is George Spears. I work for Nova School as a Citrix architect, Citrix consultant. Pretty much do Citrix, you know, every every day of the week. I'm a Citrix certified expert in fertilization, a Citrix certified professional in networking, and I'm also a Citrix technology advocate. The Citrix technology advocate award was presented to just under 80 people from around the world. So. I've been lucky enough to be awarded um, letter accreditation from Citrix themselves. So today's webinar is based on what's new, what's the new features in Citrix Synap and Send Desktop. Um, so in this slide, you see a number of versions that have been released, um, starting from 7.7 all the way to 7.14. The latest version of Citrix Send Up and Send Desktop is 7.15, which was released probably around a month ago. But if we start um, at 7.7, .7, we can see some of the new features that I've listed, and these aren't extensive, these are just the ones that I've listed and picked, hand-picked out. So we can see at 7.7, .7, uh, Citrix released support for Windows 10. They also brought, up, brought out a couple of new features, such as zones and app limits and notifications and alerts in Citrix Director. If we move on to 7.11, we see Server 2016 support. We also see a new protocol called Adaptive Display version 2. 7.12 came localhost cache, um, which is a SQL high availability feature, and workspace environment management, which we'll discuss later in the webinar. 7.13 brought out Adaptive Transport, which is another um, ICA transport delivery me uh, mechanism. 7.14 brought out multi-type licensing. So I'll cover a couple of these features today and hopefully you'll see the benefit in them and you'll then be able to start planning your Citrix farm upgrades to the latest release. At the top here I've listed out the most recent uh, releases from Citrix and you can see the dates that they were released. 7.7 .7 was released in November 2015 and 7.8 was released in February 2016. If you look at the dates closely, you'll probably see a trend from Citrix and that trend is they're releasing new versions uh, around every quarter. So every sort of three to four months, Citrix will release a new version of Synap and Synth Desktop. So I think Citrix have to come up with a way to define how they're going to support all these different releases, you know, what's a cutoff point? If a customer is on 7.7, .7, how long do we support them for? If you look at the bottom graph, um, this at the top, uh, we see four different versions of Citrix Send Up and Send Desktop, and these are labeled as current release versions. And so we'll have four versions generally in one 12 month period. So how long are Citrix gonna support a version? So when a version is first released, so if a version was first released today from Citrix, it would be able to run um, for six months. After a six month period, it becomes end of maintenance. So what that means, what end of maintenance means, after six months, you can still get support, but Citrix won't provide any code level fixes if you have any faults or issues with the product. And once a version has been running for 18, 18 months, Citrix will mark it as end of life. So after, if you install Citrix Send Up, Send Desktop, it was released today, you install it today, you'll have a shelf life of 18 months. After the 18 month period, you will not be uh, entitled to any support. The product will be end of life. If you were to install a say for example you were to install 7.15 of Synap Send Desktop which is the latest release and a couple of versions are released after that but you still stick on 7.15 and you have an issue Citrix might ask you to upgrade as part of their troubleshooting so they might ask you to upgrade to the latest release 
So that's something to keep in mind. So if you're planning to upgrade to your environments, just remember that after six months, the product will, the version will go end of maintenance. And after 18 months, the version will go end of life. So you're really encouraged to keep on top of the, the upgrades and make sure you're not falling, falling too far behind. Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016 support with Citrix. So in Synop, Syn Desktop 7.7, Citrix release support for Windows 10. And in 7.11, they released support for Windows Server 2016. <clears throat> so if you're planning to upgrade to Windows 10, maybe you have Windows 7 now, or you use Server OS, so you have Server 2012, and you're wondering, you know, what version do you go to? Well, these are the these are the versions that, that support it at a minimum, but you really want to upgrade to the latest version, which is currently 7.15. In 7.14.1, um, Citrix released support for Windows 10 creators update. And I want to take a moment to discuss the Windows 10 versions as well. So there's a couple of different versions of Windows 10, and there will continue to be so. I think uh, Microsoft has decided that they'll release two sort of major versions of Windows 10 per year. And they put these versions into what they call channels. So at the bottom of the screen, we see in a semi-annual channel targeted. So that, in short, stands for SAC targeted. So as a new Windows 10 version is released, it goes into the SAC targeted channel. And this is really for home users. So home users will always get the latest versions of Windows 10 through automatic updates. And the current version of Windows 10 in the SAC channel, or the SAC targeted channel, is Windows 10 Fall Creators Update. And Fall Creators Update was released uh, in September, just last month. So it's the latest version of Windows 10. And Citrix, even though it is a home, it, or it shouldn't be in the business, the Windows 10 uh, Fall Creators Update should not be used in business, but Citrix will provide limited support for that operating system. And if you look at this, there's the second channel is semi-annual channel. So once an operating system has been running uh, for, I think it's maybe around six months, uh, it then moves to a semi-annual channel. And the semi-annual channel is fully supported by Citrix. And it is business a business targeted operating system. Um, so at the minute, the Windows 10 version that's currently in the semi-annual channel is Windows 10 Creators Update, which was released in March of 2017. And the final channel they have is a long-term servicing branch channel. And at the moment, the, the operating system version, which is currently in this channel, is Windows 10 Anniversary Update. And Windows 10 Anniversary Update was released in July of 2016. Again, this version is also fully supported in Citrix in the latest release of 7.15. And uh, so yeah, if you're doing an upgrade to Windows 10, just keep in mind of what version you, you're going to go for. You can go for Anniversary Update, or you could go for Creators Update. But I would probably avoid going for Fall Creators Update, because it's just a bit too early. And Citrix will only provide limited support at this stage. One of the new features in uh, Synapse and Desktop from 7.11 is Adaptive Display version 2. So what this is, is it's a display protocol, which is a mixture, mixture of H.264 and non-H.264. So H.264 is a compression codec. It's used widely across the internet to deliver video content to your end user device, so your PCs and your laptops and whatnot. What it does is it compresses video um, so that it can be downloaded by your end client quicker. And it's a popular codec. Uh, Citrix have used it for many versions of Synapse and Syn Desktop. And what it does, again, is when you're playing, say, a YouTube video on a Citrix desktop, the codec compresses that and then it sends it to your user device quick and it'll generally be quicker because there's less data to be to be downloaded over over the wire 
but in previous versions, so before uh, Synapse in Desktop 7.11, there was only two options for H.264. You either enabled it or you disabled it. If you enable it, it's enabled for everything full screen. If you disable it, and then obviously it's disabled for everything as well. Um, and enabling it is a good thing because you'll get decreased bandwidth. But it uses CPU, so your processor power on your Citrix desktops will be impacted because it's spending time compressing data. So if you haven't got much CPU processing power left or you're, you're stuck for some CPU, it's not a good idea to enable um, H.264 fully. <laughs> and if you disable it, you, you don't obviously get the impact so much on the CPU, but you get impact on bandwidth, so data isn't being compressed when it's disabled. So you're going to be, um, you'll have a higher consumption of bandwidth when you're playing video content and such through Citrix desktops or applications. So on 7.11, Citrix uh, released Adaptive Display V2, and this is a way to run pretty much the best of both worlds. So you'll have H.264, you can have it enabled, and it only compresses uh, moving content, so content that moves. So if you look at this screen in this picture, <clears throat> you can see inside the green the green bar, you see a video playing, and it's being compressed. It's being compressed by H.264, but the data around it, so the still images and the, the text, which doesn't change, is not compressed. So you really get a good mixture of both. Um, and so that means you, you save on bandwidth, from the video that's being compressed and you save on CPU for the text and data and images that aren't being compressed. So it's a good protocol and it's definitely worth enabling when you move to 7.11 or above. Another feature released in 7.13 is adaptive transport. So everything you see on your Citrix desktop and applications, that visual screen you see is delivered by a protocol called ICA. And ICA has always traditionally been transported via TCP. But in 7.13, uh, Citrix released a way to transport ICA over UDP. And UDP essentially means less traffic because with TCP, you have a lot of acknowledgements that go back and forth between the client and the server when you're transporting data, but you don't get that with UDP. UDP sends a, a packet, but it doesn't follow it up. So in, in essence, it doesn't really care if it reaches the destination. It just trusts that it does. So on the left-hand side, you see three packets, a SYN, a SYNAC, and an ACK packet. Uh, packet. And that's what creates a TCP session. But over on the right hand side, UDP, it doesn't have any of the acknowledgements. So this is a good thing for Citrix because it means essentially your, your traffic gets to the destination faster. And there's also less overhead um, on the network because there's less packets essentially. So adaptive transport really gives you a good um, performance boost, especially when you're working remotely. Maybe you're working off a 3G dongle or mobile data, you're tethering off your phone, or even you're on an unreliable uh, wireless connection. You could be anywhere in the world. Um, and UDP really is a superior protocol to transport ICA traffic across. I've used it and it's incredible. It, it really does, if you've got a latent network connection, UDP works very well. The only thing it doesn't work great against is packet loss. But if you've packet loss on a connection, you know, not many things do work well anyway, even TCP. So adaptive transport would be one single reason why I would want to upgrade to the latest versions of Synapse and Desktop because it's very good. Another feature is Zones. Zones was released in 7.7. If you take a look at this picture of a an organization with three locations, Belfast, Manchester, and London. And we've got desktops, we've got users in each location. And we have one single Citrix site. The Citrix site is based in Belfast, but it, it serves all, all three regions. But if I'm a user in Belfast and I launch, say, Internet Explorer, 
there's nothing to say that I don't end up launching Internet Explorer as a published application on a Citrix server which is hosted in a Manchester data center because I have a single site which spans all three. Before before we had zones, there was nothing to say that you know I could launch a desktop from Belfast, but I'm based in London and it's not ideal. So if I'm a London user, I launch a Citrix desktop, it connects me to Belfast. Maybe there's a latent connection there, um, but essentially it's not going to be best for performance. Ideally, what we want is we want users to launch desktops from within the same location that they're situated in. So Zones was introduced in 7.7 and it really helps with organizations that span multiple locations. So what we see here, we see again a single Citrix site and it's based in Belfast, the SQL database, the site is completely in Belfast, but we have three secondary zones. So we've got a zone in Dublin, a zone in Manchester and a zone in London and each resource location has desktops and users. But what the good thing about zones is when we have Citrix desktops in Dublin, the Citrix desktops in Dublin are tied to the delivery controllers in Dublin too. The same for Manchester and the same for London. So it reduces the amount of traffic that has to traverse the WAN. So the amount of traffic from Dublin to Belfast will be minimized as much as possible because delivery controllers in Dublin are tied to uh, Citrix desktops and application servers in Dublin and the same for the other regions. We also have another concept called home zones. So we can assign users with a home zone. So if we have a bunch of users in London, we can get their usernames and pretty much say to Citrix, look, these guys, their home zone is in London. So when they launch a desktop or an application, make sure that they all always launch it from the London data center. And that really gives users the best experience because ideally what we want is again, we want users to be launching desktops and applications that are closest to them rather than launching them from across the world. So that's zones in 7.7. Another feature in 7.7 was app limits. And this is a question I got not too long ago from a customer um, who said, look, how can Citrix help me in managing my licenses? You know, I, I, I can't stop users from consuming too many licenses to what I have. So app limits, one feature that doesn't solve licensing issues, but it can help. So if you have an application and you've maybe only bought five concurrent licenses for it, or in this case, three, you can tell Citrix that you only want to limit, you want to limit the number of instances to three. So there can only be three instances of that application running at any time. And if a fourth user tries to connect, they'll get denied. So it's a way to sort of control licenses as best you can. Localhost cache, uh, it was released in 7.12 and this is a highly available feature. Citrix uh, relies on SQL Server and SQL Database and it's where all the configuration of a Citrix site is uh, stored. So we need to make sure that SQL is highly available in the first instance. But we can't always guarantee that SQL is going to stay online. So we need the way to, if SQL was to fail, we still need our users to be able to connect to applications and desktops without uh, losing any productivity. So in 7.12 and above of Synapse Send Desktop, what happens is Citrix replicates the master database to a copy of the database on each delivery controller. So you can see here the master database is being replicated. So it's pretty much a snapshot of the master database is being stored on the delivery controllers. So that means if the SQLs, uh, the main SQL database was to go offline or there was a network blip or some form of issue and we couldn't contact it, what happens is lines down now the delivery controllers just use that local copy of the database. So it, they have a snapshot there. So they repoint themselves to this copy of the database that sits on the delivery controller and it allows users to still continue to access their applications and desktops. So we don't get any downtime 
even when a SQL outage occurs, and it gives us IT admins a bit of time um, to restore SQL connectivity. So this is a really good feature, um, especially in the enterprise. We have hundreds of users. You know, we can't afford any productivity loss. Workspace environment management it is a it was a product from produced by a company called Norscale and Citrix acquired Norscale in January. I don't know if it was January, but I think it was sometime early last year or the year before potentially. Um, but workspace environment management is a product that really does it helps with log on times. It's it's one of the big things that you would install it for is to reduce log on times. So if we look at the top of this picture, we look at the traditional log on of a user. So when a user launches a Citrix desktop or a Citrix application, they log on, they start to get group policies, they start to get log on scripts, they start to get drives, they start to get printer maps um, and anything else. And that's before they see their Citrix desktop. And that process can take anywhere from 40 to 80 seconds. It could even take longer. Um, it's definitely not uncommon to see longer. And I will point out that 40 seconds actually is pretty decent. Um, but what I see normally is, you know, log on times can be between 40 and 80 seconds, depending on, on what's being applied. Um, big culprits of log ons are log on scripts, especially. Um, and printer mappings and drive mappings, they all take quite a lot of time and impact the logon. And when we impact the logon, essentially we do impact the user experience as well. So this is where workspace environment management can help because if you look at the bottom section of the screen, what happens is the user logs on and then we apply everything after they've logged on. So the user can take 15 to 25 seconds to log on and this isn't a hard time to get down to. Um, it's it's very reasonable to get down to 15 to 25 seconds. So what happens is when you log on, that's when afterwards an agent runs. So there's an agent sitting on the Citrix desktop. And what happens is it processes the drives, it processes the printers, and everything pretty much the group policy did. It starts to apply them after you've logged on. So it's really good from a user experience um, point of view. Um, user perception is improved a lot because WAM runs the actions after the logon. Another thing workspace environment management can do is it can control um, CPU and memory consumption on your Citrix machines. So as you probably be aware, if you've experienced running a Citrix farm, you know, you could have a hundred users connected to a Citrix desktop but maybe only 80 of those users are, are active. You might have 20 users that are idle. They've went for lunch or they've went for a meeting and they've been idle for an hour, maybe two hours. But in the background, there's, they've still got applications open. So they're still using Internet Explorer. You know, there's, they've still got Excel open. And these all still uh, consume memory and they consume CPU. So what Workspace Environment Management does is it can detect when processes are become idle. Um, so as you see on the left here, this is an idle session without WAM. So, and this was actually screenshots from one of the tests I done. Um, I logged on to a Citrix desktop. I walked away from the screen for 10 or so minutes, became idle, but the memory never decreased. So that 345 meg that Internet Explorer was using at the very beginning, when my session was active, it was still consuming 345 meg after 10 minutes of inactivity. But if you look on the right hand side, once WEM gets involved, WEM will detect that the process is idle and it will take back and it take ba silently takes back the RAM. So you can see here that it almost dropped by 50%. And this is just one example. So this is just Internet Explorer. But users, users will obviously run a ton of apps that will consume a lot more memory than this. So you can really see the advantage of installing workspace environment management in your environment um, because it gives back memory for those active users who actually need it. And it doesn't affect the program because the program still runs. Uh, so when a user comes back from their lunch, 
they just connect back in and live, continue off as normal. Another thing WEM does, and I haven't uh, got a screenshot here, is it controls CPU as well. So it can see if you run a application which starts hammering the processor, maybe the processor stuck at 100% for three minutes or so, or maybe longer, WEM will detect that and it will drop the priority of that process to maybe low, which allows other processes to take priority and it doesn't, it avoids impacting the other users. So WEM, Workspace and Farm Management can do a whole lot more than this, um, but these are two great features and definitely recommend that you, you incorporate those uh, features into your environment. Last product that I want to talk about is Citrix App Layering. Um, so Citrix acquired a company called Unidesk last year, last January, um, called Unidesk. And they rebranded to App Layering. So as we know, managing a Citrix farm and managing images, we really have two technologies to do that. And that is PVS and MCS. But App Layering really simplifies Im image management. So what you have here at the bottom of the stack is an operating system layer. And it's, it's essentially, it's just a virtual disk. So it's a VMDK if you're running VMware or it's a VHD if you're running Hyper-V, for example. It's a, essentially just a virtual disk which contains the operating system. The operating system can be Windows 10, it can be Windows Server 2012, any, any operating system of the latest release. Above the operating system disk are application layers, and again, these are just virtual disks as well, but they only contain the application, so they're kind of like containers, and the container contains an application. It can contain Microsoft Office, Adobe, and you know all, all of any application that you can essentially think of. And these are all placed, again, in virtual disks. And then at the very top of the stack is the platform layer. And the platform layer is another virtual disk, but it just contains hypervisor tools, so VMware tools, um, Hyper-V tools, and the Citrix software, so the Citrix VDA software is in the platform layer as well. So when you want to produce an image, so you want to produce a desktop with Word, you want um, Google Chrome in there, and you want Windows Server 2012, what you do is you just hand pick, okay, I want the Windows Server 2012 OS layer, I want the Word application layer, the Google Chrome application layer, and then what uh, App Layering does is it joins all them individual disks together to complete, to make a complete image, and that presents you with a complete desktop. So if we, had, if we had created an image with the OS layer here at the bottom and Adobe and Word, but then we want to remove Adobe because we no longer need it. All we do is tell App Layering to remove the Adobe application layer disk. It takes it out of the of the stack, and then it gives you a new disk with only Word and the OS layer in there, and you can publish that out uh, to your to your environment. And then users log on and consume those resources. So it really does um, simplify application management and operating system management. And in all, it, it simplifies image management and image life cycles. So you see at the top, if we didn't have app layering, which we may not have today, we use PVS, for example, to manage our images. So at the top here, we have three separate images. We have a shared desktop, we have a finance image, and an HR image. The shared desktop has Google Chrome, Microsoft Office, that's fine. The finance image, because it's finance, we've been asked to keep that isolated, so that image needs to be isolated. Okay, so now we have to build another Windows Server 2012 image. And then the HR application, it can only use Office 2010. It can't use Office 2016. So again, we have to now create another image. So we've got three separate images. We've got three copies of Server 2012, three copies of the Citrix VDA, two copies of Microsoft Office. So you can see here, I've got 19 different images, or sorry, images, 19 different um, objects to manage. So when I want to patch Server 2012, I have to do it three times. When I want to update 
VMware tools, I have to crack open three images and patch them, package them up, republish. The same for Microsoft Office. If I want to patch, I have to do it twice. As you can see, that can take a lot of administrators' time. So at the bottom here, we have app layering. And this is how it does things, because you only have one, now you only have one OS layer, which is Server 2012. You only have one platform layer, which is the Citrix VDA and VMware tools. And you only have one copy of Microsoft Office. So you can see from having 19 objects to manage, I now have just 10. So when I want to patch the operating system, I only patch it once. When I want to uh, patch Microsoft Office, I only need to patch it once. So this is really how app layering can simplify image management. And when there's times where you need to patch, such as a maybe there was a another wanna cry in the future, and you're against the clock to patch, app layering will allow you to patch and get that patch out a lot quicker than um, you would have been able to do in the past. Guys, thank you for the uh, joining, attending the webinar. That is the end. It was quite quick. Um, hopefully you've picked up a couple of um, tips and you have some more reason now to upgrade the latest versions of Synapse and Syn Desktop. If you have any questions, do reach out to us. Um, Una's email, Una Fernand, should, her email will be on um, attached to the GoTo webinar emails that you would have gotten. So please reach out if you have any questions. Again, thank you for joining.